Welcome to Black Renaissance. I'm your host, Kristen Ayers. We start the new year with some tech talk, movies, and a special guest. But first, when former First Lady Michelle Obama, in her book, Becoming, talked about her daughters, Sasha and Malia, and her struggle with infertility, she sparked a conversation about in vitro fertilization, particularly among black women, who contrary to perception, have higher rates of infertility than married American white women. Well, we're going to continue that conversation this morning, and uh, I have with me two guests, naturopathic doctor Amat Shah, founder of Holistic Fertility Center. Welcome to you. Thank and you. also author of Fertility Secrets, What Your Doctor Didn't Tell You About Baby Making, along with Yale and Harvard graduate Dr. Colin Smeichel. He's He's the founder and medical director of Laurel Fertility Care in San Francisco. Welcome to Black Renaissance, both of you. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, now, I just want to start talking about, certainly when Michelle Obama talks about it, it just makes waves across the world. So when she talked about her own infertility struggle, a lot of people start asking questions about their own fertility and wondering about their own lives. So Dr. Smeichel, tell me about what the common cause of infertility is. Uh, what age do women start seeing infertility and uh, what struggles are they facing? Well, infertility comes in different um, formats and different different categories, if you will, and women will start struggling in different age groups uh, about specific things. Specifically in African-American women, one of the things that commonly, commonly comes up are issues like fibroids, uh -huh. uterine factors, um, tubal factors, and that's one of the things that makes it more likely that they may have challenges. Other women may actually have ovulatory problems, um, or especially if you're older when you start trying, may end up having more problems related to either um, just not having good quality eggs or having more challenges in terms of um, fertilization or development. And so we, when we talk about things. older, we're, we're uh, talking uh, about uh, over 35, right? Typically, that's when you'd imagine that they would. But now, especially when we're looking at younger women who are going through challenges, women who are actually looking at, say, egg donation or um, embryo bank, egg banking, they're realizing that some of the things that we took for granted, being age, may not be as um, the, the most important thing. It is the most important related to having some good quality eggs, but not all women are gonna actually have that same issue. So it's important to know. Okay, uh, now Dr. Shaw, I know you're a naturopathic doctor, and so you're, you're focusing more on lifestyle and yes. um, sort of the factors that uh, people can use to control their fertility. Um, so tell me, can you really control your fertility? What mm -hmm. can you do to um, fight you know, the possibility, make it more likely that you can have children? That's a great question because yes and no, yes, you can to a certain extent control or have some impact on what your ovaries and uterus is doing and the health of it. Um, and then on another hand, we're aging and that's a reality and that's a fact and there isn't a whole lot we can do about that. So sure. some of the lifestyle changes that I talk about a lot, uh, especially in the book, but in general, uh, definitely to quit smoking. Um, reducing alcohol and coffee. Those are pretty major. I feel like most women that are on the fertility path have heard of these things and right. are doing them. Mm -hmm. uh, and then uh, another piece is the movement piece. And that's really where I brought this model um, so that I can show you just like the uterus and the ovaries are kind of smashed in between the colon and the bladder. Mm -hmm. It's already pretty tight in there. And then guess what? We sit all day long. So we're sitting like this, crushing the uterus and, and ovaries. So we're blocking off the blood flow and circulation. So just being able to get standing and really like movement into the pelvis. So my favorite is dancing. <laughs> I prescribe that to all of my patients. Uh -huh. Get into the hips because that actually helps blood flow and circulation to the uterus and ovaries. Absolutely. I mean, you can't. I mean, any sort of exercise is going to help you no matter what, particularly something that's going to help that area. Yes. Um, Dr. Smeichel, can you talk to us about a lot of people are considering as early as their 20s uh, to look at uh, the possibility of freezing their eggs. Is that really an effective method? Uh, what's the success rate when you're when you're freezing eggs? That's actually a great thing, and a, a one thing that comes up a lot more often now, especially since a lot of the technology companies are offering it as a benefit for patients. Um, the important thing is just that women after around 35, um, the, the, we call the quality or the eggs diminish. So a woman who is going to actually get pregnant at 35 is going to have a lower success than someone at 30. So that, that cutoff in terms of when it's going to be a good transition is someplace between 20 and, say, 30 and 35. Mm -hmm. Before 30, 
Most times it may not be as helpful because most people who are going to use their eggs are going to use it within say five or seven years. So if you're 27 or 28, you're going to stop, fall below that 35 criteria. If you're after 35, you can still do it, but at the same time the success and also the need for more eggs is going to be important. After 35, you may end up having to freeze twice as many eggs as someone who's older or younger only because the average number of eggs you're going to actually need to create a normal embryo sometime in the future is going to change. So it sounds like there's definitely a window in there. I believe we have um, some sound with you talking about harvesting eggs. We will take a needle and it goes into each of the ovaries and then we just basically go into the egg or into the ovary, get all the eggs and then we'll just go from follicle to follicle and that's how we're doing the retrieval. Essentially what you're doing is going into the ovary with that and then removing the fluid with the float the egg inside. Right. Okay. The key thing is basically going through. That is a fascinating process uh, and uh, something that I think a lot of people don't necessarily see or, or you know don't know to expect when they're just beginning this journey. Um, so Dr. Shaw, uh, talk to me about what some of the, you've, you've told us what we we shouldn't do uh, and some things that we can do. Are there any other uh, lifestyle changes that people can make to make sure they're in a position uh, to have a baby as they're kind of starting that journey? Yeah, yeah. Really, diet plays a key role mm -hmm. in, in all of our health, but definitely our fertility. And in terms of food, we're really looking at avoiding dairy. There's lots of data that suggests dairy is detrimental to our fertility. So cutting it out, uh, we talked about the coffee and alcohol, um, and then we really want to avoid processed foods, GMOs, and uh, glyphosate, which is a new player on the block, sort of. <laughs> it's Roundup, uh, and it gets sprayed especially on wheat. So a lot of the wheat sensitivities that we're seeing in people, it's showing up on lab tests, is based on the fact that wheat is sprayed so heavily with glyphosate. Wow, okay, that was one I had not heard, so I'm interested to just kind of go and, and explore that and just learn a little more about that. Um, Dr. Smichael, when, when we're talking about, you know, consuming different things um, and, and just how that plays into our fertility, uh, you, you also uh, have talked about um, how genetics play into our fertility as well. Um, so tell me a little bit about that. I know there's some new testing out there, relatively new, that, you know, many years ago wasn't available. Uh, how, what does genetic testing tell a woman about her ability to have a child? Well, it tells more about that ability of that embryo to implant. Okay. So we talked a bit earlier about not having a lot of good quality eggs, and that was a factor in terms of women getting pregnant later on. We know, we now, sorry, we know that the biggest reason why that becomes an issue is that many of those embryos are abnormal. So if you can get information about the embryo before you transfer that embryo, you're going to end up having a much higher implantation rate. Now, we're even doing it where women are actually considering or families are considering doing genetic testing so we can maximize the chance that they're going to be successful with each transfer and minimize how many embryos we're transferring. So often, if you're doing genetic testing and you can identify and transfer only one normal embryo, most times you're going to end up having a higher chance of success and the chance of actually having any kind of miscarriage is actually diminished. Right. So women who even that they're older, especially after they get to 35, 40 and beyond, may consider the genetic testing as a better means in terms of identifying embryos. Because you have a higher likelihood to have some abnormal eggs in there and you can, you can test for that. That is a huge assurance for a lot of people, I'm sure. Thank you so much for talking to us about this. It's kind of a speed round of you know everything you ever wondered about IVF. I so appreciate having both of you on. Um, for more information about Laurel Fertility Care, you can visit their website, laurelfertilitycare.com. And don't for forget to check out Dr. Shaw's book. It is Fertility Secrets, What Your Doctor Didn't Tell You about baby making. And coming up, my special guest will be here, Vern Glenn with the newest Harlem Globetrotter.